Hi, welcome back. About a week ago, I tried valuing Uber using its users. I tried to value existing users and new users. And along the way, I had to make lots of assumptions, assumptions about the li lifetime of a user, the, the renewal rate, the cash flows, the growth. I mean, the, the valuation was filled with assumptions. In fact, I'll, I'll back up. There wasn't a single fact in that valuation. Every single number was an estimate. And those estimates were actually based on information that was either noisy or dated or secondhand because partly because Uber is a small, is a private company and is secretive about its information, and partly because the business itself is evolving. Now you might say, why bother? Why try valuing companies when there's so much uncertainty? I believe that valuation is still useful because much of the uncertainty that I face when valuing Uber has little to do with the fact that Uber has very little information out there. Much of it is coming from outside. And I believe that even a noisy valuation model is better than just taking a pricing. You know, what I mean by pricing is taking a price per user that other people are doing and then extrapolating from there. And finally, I think even a simplistic valuation model like mine, based on information that is tough to get, can be used to eke out some very general propositions about the value of user-based companies. So let's get started. When I, think about, when I think about the uncertainty in evaluation, one of the first things I try to do, and this may seem pointless to you, but it helps me, is to categorize the uncertainty. And one of the categorizations I use is I ask myself, is this uncertainty estimation uncertainty or economic uncertainty? You might say, what's the difference? Estimation uncertainty comes from the fact that you don't have enough information. The information might have missing pieces, might be misleading, might not be provided to you. Economic uncertainty comes from the fact that the business is changing, competition is changing, macroeconomic factors, interest rates, inflation are changing. Now, why am I drawing this distinction? Well, I can reduce estimation uncertainty by collecting more information, right? So as Uber becomes a public company or as it reveals more information, I can reduce, I will not make it go away, but I can reduce estimation uncertainty. Economic uncertainty, on the other hand, there's nothing that all this information is gonna help me do. So estimation uncertainty you can reduce by collecting more information. Economic uncertainty is immune from that kind of data collection. You're saying, so what? Most of the uncertainty when valuing a company like Uber comes from economic uncertainty. It's not coming from estimation uncertainty. So even if Uber became a public company with all the information you think you will get, don't expect to wake up one day with a lot more precision and certainty in your valuations. So to me, it helps me be realistic about the fact that uncertainty is not going to go away. Here's a second aspect of uncertainty that I found is, is, is something you have to deal with. Uncertainty is a fact of life. You can't wish it away, you can't pray it away, you can't analyze it away. I mean, the way I describe it is, is when you value companies, uncertainty is going to come at you no matter how hard you try. So there are two choices you have when it comes to uncertainty. One is you can make explicit assumptions knowing that you're going to be wrong 100% of the time, which is what I've tried to do with my Uber valuation. The other is you can refuse to make assumptions hiding behind the fact that there's uncertainty and you can make implicit assumptions. You make implicit assumptions when you pay $1,500 per user or $1,000 per subscriber, which is what a lot of pricing is based on. So your real choice is not whether you make assumptions, but whether those assumptions are gonna be explicit assumptions or implicit assumptions. And here's the third aspect of uncertainty that I'd like to put on the table. And this is something I've talked about, written about before. I think that the healthiest way to deal with uncertainty is look it in the face. What do I mean by look it in the face? Visualize it. See how uncertain you are. Tell the world how uncertain you are. It's not shameful. There's nothing shameful about accepting the fact that your estimate of value could be wrong and could be horribly wrong. In fact, I took my Uber user valuation. And if you remember, the value per user that I got was about $410 per user using a traditional base case model. And then I did a Monte Carlo simulation. You've seen me use this before in other valuations, but rather than give a single input for each variable, I've given a distribution. So here, for instance, I let some of the assumptions in my Uber user, user, user valuation model, in, you know, starting with the lifetime, the growth rate, I mean, the big assumptions that, and made them distributions. The end result of making them distributions is my value per user at Uber now is a distribution.
Let me give away the, the non-surprising facts. The median value across all of these simulations that I ran, and I ran 100,000, is about $414 per user. We're very close to my base case, but that should come as no surprise because my distributions are centered around my base case distributions. But look at the spread in the value. It could be less than 100, could be more than 1,000. You're saying, that doesn't help me. I think it does because, in a sense, it tells you, look, you're estimating the value for Uber with a lot of uncertainty. That number will have to get revisited. Don't be surprised if it moves a lot from period to period. And when somebody else comes up with a different value per user, don't tell them they're wrong because you have no way of, uh, of knowing. Their set of facts and assumptions might be different from yours. So I wanted to put the, those, those three aspects of uncertainty on the table before I started talking about how I'm going to use my user-based model to extract some general propositions. So here's the first one. Now, when we look at companies and we're investing in companies, we want them to make money. That's stating, stating the obvious. So it's not good for a company to lose money. That said, though, if you're investing in a young company, you should expect it to lose money. Early in a life cycle, companies lose money not because they're bad companies, but because that's what happens early in the life cycle. That said, though, not all losses are created equal. In other words, when a company loses money, there are two reactions you get to it. One is from old time investors who say, hey, if it's losing money, you can't invest in it. it's a bad company. And I think that's wrong. At the other extreme, you're people saying, well, losing money is not a big deal. You don't have to make money. And that's not right either. The truth is, when a company loses money, you need to see why it loses money, because the reason it loses money can allow you to distinguish between good losses and bad losses. Sounds like a weird thing, but let's take the Uber example. If you remember in the Uber example, I took the existing financials of Uber and tried to e eke out from it because the facts were not clear how much of the costs were spent servicing existing users and how much was spent getting new users. Okay? You're saying, who cares? It turns out that it does matter because in, if I took my user valuation model, kept everything else constant at Uber and just change the percentage of operating expenses the, the, each year that go to acquiring new users, here's what you see. As the percentage of my expenses that go to acquiring new users increases from 0% to 100%, the value of my existing users and my new users goes up. And let's think about why. The value of an existing user goes up because the more money I'm spending on new users, the less I'm spending servicing existing users so they become more valuable. But here's the ironic side, is as my existing user value goes up, my new user value also goes up. So if I were to draw a proposition is if I have a money losing company, I'd much rather that it lose money because it's going out to try to get new users than it's losing money because it's servicing existing users. Here's my second proposition. When you look at the operating expenses of a company, some of those expenses are variable expenses. They move with your revenues and others are fixed expenses. And here again, it does matter what your company's expenses look like. The greater the proportion of your company's expenses that are fixed, the greater the value you will get for your company. And here is the reason why. If you have fixed expenses and you're a growing company, what will happen is those fixed expenses will grow at a rate slower than your revenues. That's my distinction between fixed and variable. And if your fixed expenses grow slower than your revenues, you get economies of scale. So as you grow, you'll actually see your cost structures start to bend and your losses will become profit. So if I'm looking at a money losing company, I want to know how much of those expenses that it has are fixed expenses that will grow at a rate less than revenues and how much are variable expenses. There's one caveat I'd like to add. As a company matures, having a lot of fixed expenses can turn and bite you because what will happen is we have lots of fixed expenses you will then become a riskier company. So there'll be a tipping point where you want to go back to a more flexible cost structure. But if you're a young user-based company, you'd rather have a lot of fixed expenses than variable expenses. Let's turn to growth. Now we reward young companies for growing and that makes sense. For most young companies, we think of growth as a good thing, but just like all losses are not created equal, not all growth is created equal. So when you look at a company growing, you'd like to know why it's growing because there are two ways a, comp a user-based company can grow. One is because existing users are upping how much they spend on your products and services. So it's revenue growth from existing users. The other is by adding new users. And here again, 
you can look at the impact and value. If I increase my revenue growth from existing users, I'm able to sell my existing users more and more stuff. The growth rate I get from annual re on annual revenues from existing users increases. My value increases not just for existing users, but also for new users. The reason it increases for existing users is because the growth rate is going up, but because my new user value is a function of my existing user value, I get a jump in value. And you can actually see that if I focus on adding new users and I don't grow my existing user revenue, there's a tipping point where actually growth can hurt me because if my growth rate in existing users is 0%, in other words, what I sell them is fixed at whatever I'm selling them right now, it turns out that adding more users destroys value because the value I'm getting per existing user is less than the cost of adding a user. Now, if I increase growth rate in new users, again, the impact on value is positive, but the impact is less positive. Now, the reason being that new users cost me more money to acquire. I'd much rather grow revenues from existing users than new users. So here's my proposition. If I'm looking at a company, a user-based company that's growing, I'd, much, I'd value growth coming from existing users more than growth from new users. For companies, it's, it's a, there is a lesson for managers as well because companies often face a trade-off. Should we focus on growing revenues from existing users or should we take those scarce resources and try to go after new users? And from a valuation perspective, if you can extract more growth from existing, you'd, you'd love to have both, but if you have to have a choice, I'd much rather have growth coming in from existing users because that growth is more valuable. Now let's turn to some general business propositions and I'm going to use my user based model to look at things like big data and network effects because it allows me to convert these buzzwords into value. It's going to show me the connection to value. Second, it's also going to let me decide what kind of revenue model is best for my company. After all, if you're a user based company, there are three ways you can make revenues. One is to charge subscription, a subscription based model. The second is to try to, is transaction based. Uber, for instance, is a transaction based. Your users have to transact with you for you to make revenues. The third is, like Facebook, you make your revenues from advertising. So we can look at user-based models to talk about the pluses and minuses of each of these revenue models. And finally, in valuation, there's this notion of real options. Much talked about, but often a lot of hand-waving goes around because it's very difficult to value. With user-based models, you might be able to extract some real implications from real option value. In other words, when would you pay for option ad? So let's start with, with, the, with the basic structure of the model. If you look at user-based user -based companies in general. There are two things that drive your value. The first is how much is the value of, an ex of a user? And the second is how much it costs you to acquire a user. Here's your best case scenario, a great company. A great company will be one that gets a huge value per user and doesn't have to spend much to acquire new users. So if the value per user is high and the cost per user is low, you get the highest possible value. So let's call those companies the great companies. Those are very uncommon. The very good companies are companies where the value per user is high and the cost per user is also high, but the value is much higher than the cost. Then you've got the mediocre companies. These are the companies which tread water. They have low value per user, low cost per user. They're like commoditized user company. You don't make much money per user. You might have a value, but it's not going to be that high. And then you have the destructive companies. You know, these are the companies that, that are truly disasters. These are companies where the value per user is low and the cost of acquiring new users is high. Now, if you, if you step back, here's a very simple and obvious proposition. To be an exceptional company then, you want to have a high value per user and a low cost per user. Why is that exceptional? Because it's really tough to pull off because if your cost per acquiring new user is low and it's low for everybody in the business, it's going to drag down the value per user. So, uh, so competition is usually going to mean that this combination is very uncommon, but it's not impossible because there are companies and you can name them, Google's, the Facebooks of the world that have pulled this off and you have to ask, or Netflix, I mean, what do they do that gives them the high value? And here's where I think that we can bring in those two big terms that you see used in business, big data and networking benefits into play. If you have networking benefits, here's what I hear from a valuation perspective. Your cost of adding a new user decreases as you get bigger. So if you're a company with big networking benefits, you can actually push down your cost of acquiring new users much lower than your competition. 
If you add to that big data, data you're collecting from your existing users that you can use to sell them more stuff, create products and services that are better for them, you can increase your value per user. So an exceptional company basically uses big data to pump up the value per user because that you know you use proprietary data. And that's what the Netflix and the Amazons of the world do and uses networking benefits to drive down the cost. And if you can break, pull that off, and it's a, it's a tough it's a tough combination to pull off. You can see why the, the key to becoming an exceptional company. Let's talk about revenue models. As I said, three basic models, the subscription model, the Netflix model, the transaction model, the Uber model, the advertising model, which is the Facebook model. And then you have companies like LinkedIn, which are hybrid models that get some from each. LinkedIn Premium is a subscription. LinkedIn, you know, the, the job connections is transaction based. And you also have advertising. Now, which, mo which model is best? Well, they all have their pluses and minuses. A subscription model creates some more sticky users. In other words, people tend to stay on on subscription-based models much more than they do on transaction or advertising models, but it costs you more to acquire users and your growth rate per user is going to be low because the so if you take Netflix, you're not gonna get 20% growth each period because you're not selling them more stuff. A transaction-based model is it is, it can create less sticky users, but it allows you for more potential growth per user because you can sell them more stuff. You can get them to do more transactions with you. But it's a riskier model. And an advertising-based model, the plus is you can grow really fast. You can add new users because it doesn't cost you that much. But it is also a model where you're going to have to work. The value per user will depend very much on how much you can attract advertising. It's a riskier model. So each model has its pluses and minuses, and they show up in the numbers. So here's my general proposition. The right revenue model for you will depend on who you are as a company, where you are in the life cycle, and what your objective is. So if your objective is, I want to grow really fast, and I want to show lots more users every period, you're probably going to go with an advertising model. But there's going to be a point in your life cycle where your investors might say, look, we don't care about the users. We want revenues, in which case, you might have to think about, hey, can I shift to a subscription-based model? So there is no one right optimal revenue model. It might actually vary for the same company across the life cycle, vary across companies in the same business. But the question for your company has to be, do you have the right revenue model for your company? And you have to look at the specifics of your company, the pluses and minuses that I talked about to decide what the right revenue model is. Finally, let's talk about real options. The value of a real option comes from the drivers of an option value. So if you think about stickiness of users, you have users who are going to be with you for the long term, that drives the life of the option. If you talk about intensity of users, users being on your on your, uh, on your platform for long periods, you can sell them more stuff. So it gives you a chance to sell them because the essence of a real option is you you don't know what you're going to be able to do, but basically what you're saying is, I have this user base and I'll figure out something I can do with them. I can sell them stuff in the future. I haven't figured it out yet, so I can't build it into my expected cash flows, but I'll figure something out. So the more intense you use us, the greater the chance you have of selling them stuff. So that's going to drive the value of the underlying asset, the S and the K in the option pricing model. And the more your business is in a state of flux, either because technology is changing or your customer tastes are changing, the greater the value the option will become. So all of those drive the value of an option on an existing user. And the more users you have, the greater the value of the overall optionality. So here's my general proposition. The value of optionality, the premium that you add on top of an intrinsic value, will be greatest in businesses which have sticky users, intense users, and where the future is unpredictable because the technology and customer tastes are changing. Okay? And that value is going to get magnified by how many users you have. So if you look at a company like Facebook with almost 2 billion users, you've got the numbers working for you and you have intense users. A typical Facebook user spends a lot of time each day. You can see why optionality is going to be much greater at a Facebook than at a Twitter where the intensity is much lower. So if you're going to talk about optionality, I'm not, I might not have given you the specifics of, to come up with the value of the option, but at least you have the variables you might want to focus on. So here's the bottom line. You might not like the assumptions I make, uh, I made in my user-based valuation rule, but that's fine. I, I, I don't claim ownership of the right numbers. Take the model, tweak it, 
change it, but use the model to kind of think about other user-based companies, whether it's Netflix or even, I mean, because let's face it, it's not just user-based companies like Facebook and Netflix that you're going to be valuing with this. Traditional companies are increasingly moving to user-based models. I mean, Microsoft and Adobe, I've been a user of Microsoft and Adobe products for as long as I've been around. But in the last two years, I've become a subscriber with Microsoft on Office 365 with Adobe because I'm an annual subscriber to Creative Cloud. So they've moved, they're moving at least a portion of their business to a subscription-based model. You could actually argue that Apple, even though it's a smartphone company, the greatest cash machine, has a billion users that it could potentially use for other to sell other products and services to. Amazon Prime, that's another post in the making. Is that no, that's a seven you know, seventy to hundred million members. What does Amazon plan to do with them? So much of what we've talked about in the context of user and subscriber value you can apply to companies that you might not might not think of as user and subscription based companies. So it's a fascinating new new pl new place in valuation and let's face it as investors we need to start understanding user-based value much better if we're going to invest in these companies and if you're managers in these companies you need to understand the value dynamics of the trade-offs you have to make as a manager and what's going to increase your value more i hope you found this session useful i've, I've enjoyed talking about users so maybe i'll return to this in the context of other companies that i valued in the past take care